Hello everybody and welcome back to another anatomy tutorial. Today we're going to be looking at the deep neck spaces as well as the deep cervical fascia that separates and encases the various different neck spaces. Now a lot of you have been asking me to cover this topic and I know why because when we start learning head and neck anatomy looking at axial slices of the neck can be really intimidating. There's so much anatomy going through such a small space and hopefully by the end of this talk you'll become comfortable with compartmentalizing the neck into the different spaces then it becomes much easier to identify the anatomy as well as knowing what is normal and what is abnormal now the first thing we need to do is separate the neck into a suprahyoid and an infrahyoid neck so if you look at this sagittal ct scan here if we draw a line through the hyoid bone anything above that line is known as the suprahyoid neck anything below that line is the infrahyoid neck now we're going to start by looking at about this level of the infrahyoid neck on a still image. I'm not going to scroll through it and I'm going to show you the different components of the deep cervical fascia. So let's have a look at this axial T1 weighted slice of the neck and just orientate ourselves first. So this is the anterior side of the patient, our trachea lying anteriorly with the strap muscles and the sternocleidomastoid muscles out anterior. And then we can see our vertebral column and our trap muscles back here. That is the posterior portion of the patient. Now, if we're going to be identifying the deep cervical fascia, it goes without saying that there's probably a superficial cervical fascia. So our superficial fascia runs along this red line. Now the superficial fascia of the neck is the same as the superficial fascia that we find throughout the body lying just underneath that subcutaneous tissue. So we can see this small layer of fat running like this and if we look closely we can see a thin muscle running on both sides there and that's our platysma muscle. If I was able to grow a beard I would contract my platysma muscle to make the skin taut on my neck and that platysma runs external to our superficial cervical fascia. Now our deep cervical fascia is split into three different fascial planes. As radiologists, we call them our superficial, middle and deep planes. Anatomists, or if you're looking in a textbook, name it differently and I'm going to show you as we go along what they call it. But essentially they're the same fascial planes. So the first fascial plane is the one outlined in blue and that's our superficial layer of our deep cervical fascia. Now you may see this in a textbook or anatomist calling this the investing layer of the deep cervical fascia and they're just synonyms but as radiologists we call it a superficial layer of our deep cervical fascia. Now that layer runs anteriorly here to our strap muscles then it encases our sternocleidomastoid muscle, heads out posteriorly encasing our trapezius muscle and then wraps all the way around the posterior here. And as we look later and we scroll up into the suprahyoid neck that then creates other different neck spaces but in the infrahyoid neck space it's encasing our sternocleidomastoid and our trapezius muscle as well as providing a fascial plane for that anterior border of our strap muscles. The next plane is our middle layer of our deep cervical fascia. Now in textbooks you may see this called the pretracheal fascia, it's the same thing but as radiologists our middle layer of our deep cervical fascia. Now that encases our trachea, our esophagus, our thyroid gland, you can see the thyroid isthmus here. Obviously our parathyroids would be involved in there too. And that space heads all the way up to the hyoid bone where it then becomes a different name but the same space essentially being encased by our middle layer of our deep cervical fascia. You can see also there it provides a fascial border on the posterior portion of our strap muscles. Now they're called strap muscles because they basically look like straps, like belt straps or bag straps that head from our hyoid bone to various portions of the neck. Then our last fascial plane here is our deep layer of our deep cervical fascia. In textbooks you might hear this called our prevertebral fascia. But as radiologists, we call this our deep layer of our deep cervical fascia. You can see it encases the uh, paravertebral muscles, the vertebral column itself and spinal cord. All of this is our deep layer of our deep cervical fascia. You can see anteriorly that it butts closely to that middle layer of the deep cervical fascia. Now if you look at these three planes, you can see they surround this space which is known as the carotid space. Now the carotid space doesn't have its own separate deep cervical fascial layer and in fact the three layers, the superficial, the middle and the deep layers all contribute to that carotid space. So now these spaces here, we've got anteriorly our middle layer of our deep cervical fascia 
forms what's called the visceral space. Now that lies below the hyoid bone, infrahyoid. It's called our visceral space. And that is basically surrounding organs that head into the viscera. Our trachea goes to a visceral organ. It goes to our lungs. Our esophagus goes to our stomach. And this fascia, as it heads down into the mediastinum, will then become continuous with our pericardium itself. That's called our visceral space. That's the first space that we've actually identified here in the infrahyoid neck. Posteriorly, this is called our perivertebral space here. So our deep layer of our deep cervical fascia surrounds our perivertebral space. And then these three fascial planes coming together surrounding this space. This is known as the carotid space. Now each of these spaces head up into the suprahyoid neck and remain those spaces. As we head further up, we'll see in the suprahyoid neck that other spaces begin to develop. Okay, so we've identified our visceral space, our carotid space, and our perivertebral space. Now you can see that I've joined the two carotid spaces with this orange line. Now, it's debatable whether this orange line actually extends all the way to the carotid space, but what this line represents is called our alar fascia. So our visceral space and our perivertebral space, the middle layer and the deep layer of our deep cervical fascia, actually abut one another and there's this thin membrane that runs, separates the two of them, called our alar fascia. Now, as you can imagine, there's no space between those. They're completely against each other. And if we were looking on a scan, we wouldn't be able to identify these different fascias from one another. But if there was fluid to track between those fascial planes or a mass to go down between those fascial planes, those potential spaces then become actual spaces. So there are two potential spaces that can form here. We have the space between our middle layer of our deep cervical fascia and the alar fascia. So anterior to that alar fascia and posterior to our visceral space, if that was to open up, that's what's known as our retropharyngeal space. This is also the same in the suprahyoid neck, uh, which we'll look at later. But our retropharyngeal space is a potential space that if fluid or infection were to track in, that would separate the middle layer of the deep cervical fascia and our alar fascia from one another. And that space heads all the way down until our middle layer and alar fascia fuse at about the level of T1. Then posteriorly to our alar fascia and anteriorly to this deep layer of our deep cervical fascia is another potential space which is known as the danger space. And the danger space heads all the way down into the thorax and the fusion happens at about the level of the diaphragm. So all the way down at the level of the diaphragm that danger space can track. And we can have infections tracking all the way down or masses or fluid tracking all the way down right to the level of the diaphragm. So if you see this space being opened up on a neck scan, we need to then investigate further into the chest to see how far the extension of that mass or fluid or infection goes. So to recap, we've got our visceral space surrounded by our middle layer of the deep cervical fascia. We've got our perivertebral space surrounded by our deep layer of the deep cervical fascia. Then we have our carotid space, which has fascia coming from our superficial, middle and deep layers. And lastly, we have these two potential spaces, our retropharyngeal space that can head all the way down to the level of T1 and our danger space lying between our alar fascia and our deep layer of our deep cervical fascia that can head all the way down to the level of the posterior diaphragm. So let's have a look at a scan where we can actually scroll through and see how these spaces change as we head inferiorly or superiorly in the scan. So here we have an axial T1 weighted scan of the neck. We can see we're at the level of the uh, mandible. And as we scroll down inferiorly, we can see our hyoid bone come into view. So we know anything inferior to this is our infrahyoid neck, exactly what we were looking at before. So let me try find a plane which is very similar to what we were looking at. So if I stop here, we can see our strap muscles, our thyroid isthmus. You can see the sternocleidomastoid, our carotid space, our perivertebral space coming here as well. And then if we head superiorly up towards the hyoid bone, we can see how those spaces change. So let's get to the level of the hyoid bone. There we are here. Our perivertebral space remains our perivertebral space. Our superficial layer of our deep cervical fascia is still surrounding the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscle here. And then what was known as our visceral space now becomes our pharyngeal mucosal space. 
it's still continuous, that fascia is still continuous up into the suprahyoid neck, but now we call it the pharyngeal space. Our carotid space remains our carotid space as well. And as I go into another scan later, I'm going to color code these and it's going to become much clearer to see these spaces um, as we head up through the neck. But I first want to show you them without the color coding so you can try and visualize for yourself where these spaces form. So let's go superior to that hyoid bone and I want you to look at our superficial layer of our deep cervical fascia covering our sternocleidomastoid and our trapezius muscle. As I head superiorly, you will see the sternocleidomastoid heads posteriorly and we can see these muscle groups coming in to the picture. I'm going to stop here. We can see that we have our muscles of mastication coming in surrounding our ramus and our body of our mandible here. Now these muscles are grouped into the next neck space that we're going to name and that's our masticator space. And you can see how superficial the masticator space was, just like our sternocleidomastoid muscle. And so this masticator space is still surrounded by our superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia. We have our medial and lateral pterygoids, as well as our masseter and our temporalis muscles making up that space. And we have our mandible coming in there. So if a mass was coming from this space, we've got muscle, we've got bone, it's likely to be a sarcoma. Another space that's developed here is this space here. You can see me outlining with my mouse. This is our parotid gland, and our parotid gland makes up the parotid space. We can see we have a superficial or lateral limb of our parotid gland, as well as a deep medial limb here of the parotid gland. It's good to notice here. We can see our parotid gland lies slightly lateral to our carotid space. And now we know this space here, which was our visceral space, has become our pharyngeomucosal space. Our perivertebral space that we identified earlier is still the perivertebral space and remains the perivertebral space all the way up to the base of the skull. So those are all our neck spaces. We've done our visceral uh, space, which was covered by our middle layer of the deep cervical fascia. We have our perivertebral space covered by the deep layer of our deep cervical fascia. And we have our carotid space heading all the way up that has contributions from the superficial middle and deep cervical fascial planes. And now that we've headed into the suprahyoid neck, we have our masticator space as well as our parotid space. We can see that lies lateral to our carotid space. And then in between, as I scroll up, you will see that there's this fatty space here between our masticator space, our pharyngeal mucosal space, our parotid space, and our carotid space. And this is perhaps the most important space in the head and neck. Now, whenever you're looking at a scan, the first thing that you should identify is this space. We can see it's bright on T1 weighted. It's the same as our subcutaneous fat here. This is a fat-filled space. This is what's known as our parapharyngeal space. A really important space to become aware of because there's not much pathology that actually arises from the par parapharyngeal space but if anything was to arise from the masticator space, it would displace that parapharyngeal space posteriorly. From our pharyngeomucosal space, it would displace it laterally. If we have a mass in our parotid gland, it would displace that fat anterior medially, and the same with our carotid space would then displace that fat anteriorly. And it's that displacement of the fat which allows us to recognize where a mass or an infection is coming from. And we can use this as a really good indicator for where the mass is coming from rather than trying to guess. Because this anatomy is so closely linked to one another, sometimes when we have a big mass, it's quite difficult to see where that mass is coming from. If we have a look at this on a CT scan, I want to show you what the parapharyngeal space looks like on a CT scan. Because often we'll be picking these lesions up incidentally. We'll be doing a CT scan or a CT neck for perhaps trauma, and then we see a mass in the neck and we need to decide where is this mass coming from. So let's scroll up to that same layer again. We get it here. We can see our masticator space here. We can see our parotid space. We can see our styloid bone here, which will become important later. I'll show you why. And we can see our pharyngeomucosal space. And laterally here, it's now dark on a CT scan, we can see that fat is hypodense on a CT scan. We've got that same look here in our parapharyngeal space here. And we, when we're scrolling through a scan, it's good to look at that, see if those fat spaces are normal. Fat's a really good clue for us to see if, mass, uh, if a mass is shifting 
So as I said, we're going to look at a color-coded version of these diagrams. I'm going to start down in the infrahyoid neck where we were, head my way up and show you the different spaces. And sometimes much easier now you can compare the right-hand side to the left-hand side and try and identify those spaces for yourself. You can see our strap muscles lying anteriorly to our visceral space here. Our sternocleidomastoid and trap muscles posteriorly. And then we have our perivertebral space heading all the way around here, and that's surrounded by our deep layer of our deep cervical fascia. And you can see how our superficial, middle, and deep layers then all encase this space, which is our carotid space. So let's follow that visceral space upwards. We're going to head all the way until we see the hyoid bone. See the hyoid bone there, and we can see that that visceral space then becomes our pharyngomucosal space. You can see our pharyngomucosal space covering the lining of our pharynx and our oropharynx and that whole mucosal lining there you can see. It lies medial to our parapharyngeal space which we'll see highlighted here in light blue. Our parapharyngeal space is then itself medial to our masticator space with our muscles of mastication, our pterygoids, as well as our masseter and temporalis muscle. The parapharyngeal space lies slightly anterior medial to this deep limb or this medial limb of the parotid gland. We can see our superficial limb there of the parotid gland going out to the periphery. And our carotid space lying posterior to that parapharyngeal space. As we head upwards, we can see how this perivertebral space remains the same all the way up. And it's sometimes good if we look at this parapharyngeal space to think of it as a cone or an upside-down pyramid. As we get closer to the base of the skull, it gets wider. And then as we head down, it becomes a point basically all the way going down to the posterior horn of this hyoid bone here. You can see it coming up here, getting bigger. So as always, I've linked these images in a Radiopedia playlist below, and I really encourage you here to spend the time scrolling through these images and learning the different spaces, and then go to a normal MRI scan, scroll through and try and identify those spaces for yourself. Now, I mentioned earlier as well that the parapharyngeal space is a really important indicator for where a mass is arising from, and I just want to show you an example of that before we head off and finish the talk. So here I've got another axial T1 weighted scan. Now T1 is really good when looking in the neck because we've got this bright fat and we can see where the fat is being shifted. Now the obvious abnormality is sitting right here, anterior to our vertebral column, medial to our mandible here. And we need to now decide where is this mass coming from. This could be coming from our pharyngeal mucosal space. You can very easily see that it could be coming from our masticator space. It could be coming also from the parotid or the carotid spaces. And this is where we need to use our parapharyngeal fat here, our parapharyngeal space. We can see it on the right-hand side of the patient here. We see where has that fat been displaced to on the left-hand side of the patient. We can see it's been displaced anteriorly and medially here. So it's very unlikely to be the masticator space because that would displace this fat posteriorly. The same with our pharyngeal mucosal space, that would displace this fat laterally. So it's likely to be coming from our parotid or our carotid spaces. Now here's another good trick to identify whether it's coming from the parotid or the carotid, is to look at our mandible and then try and identify our styloid bone. We can see our styloid bone here and our styloid bone here. And this is a stylomandibular tunnel here, or stylomandibular canal. We can see it's widened on the left-hand side of the patient because our parotid comes between the mandible and the styloid, and our carotid space lies medial to that styloid. So if we see expansion of that stylomandibular space there, or stylomandibular tunnel, we can quite confidently say that this mass is actually coming from that deep lobe of our parotid gland, extending into the parapharyngeal space, displacing that fat anterior medially. So I know it's a lot to cover, but the best way to go about this is to identify the cervical fascial layers, our superficial, middle, and deep layers, see which spaces those are creating, and then follow that space up through the neck, all the way up from the infrahyoid region, into the suprahyoid region. And if you take one thing from this talk, look at the parapharyngeal fat, see if that is being displaced. If it is, then go about looking for a mass and trying to identify where that mass comes from. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope that has helped you in some way. Let me know as always which topics you would like me to cover 
in the comment section below. And until the next video, I'll see you all. Goodbye.